Today is hands down the most beautiful day of the year. My phone says it's supposed to be a high of 51 degrees, but based on the looks of things and how I feel, it has to be closer to 60. It almost feels like 70 degrees because of the sun. So amazing. I could definitely get used to this. So we've been in full swing garden planning mode for the last couple of months. I think we all have those years where we take the something is better than nothing approach, which is awesome. I'm a huge advocate of that. But we also have those years where we feel like we're ready to personally push the boundaries of what we know and have our best garden yet and get tons and tons of produce from a relatively small area. I wanted to share with you guys what we've kind of been working on and how we've really advanced, in my opinion, our garden from last year. If you're a newer gardener, much like ourselves, we only have a few years under our belts. I think it could be really confusing and kind of mess with your mind how to maximize a small space. There's a lot of things we want to grow, but we also know we can't grow everything under the sun. Not only do we have to decide what to plant, but we have to decide where to plant it, how to arrange our space, when to put stuff in the ground, and then if you're like us this year, we want to maximize every day of the growing season, which means we're ready to start our seeds indoors, and we've had to do a lot of research to figure out when do we start them? Do we start them all at the same time as some arbitrary date, or do we want to kind of stagger when we start the seeds. And then, what do we want to start indoors and what do we want to direct sow into the garden? There's so many decisions. Also, if you're a newer gardener and getting started is kind of overwhelming and intimidating, I can tell you, Last year we put very little thought into our garden. We bought all of our plants from a local nursery as transplants. We didn't get them in the ground until mid to end of June, including direct sowing some seeds. We did have decent soil, we did mulch, we did have a pretty good watering system, but I could say that we got a boatload of food not overthinking things, but this year we're ready to overthink. We're gonna head inside and we're really gonna drill into what I think is the gold that we've discovered through our research in the last couple of months. So to me, if you're really wanting to get serious about planning your garden, you have to start with goals, right? How do you know how to get there if you don't have a roadmap? Are you growing a garden so that you can eat fresh from it the duration of the growing season? Oh my Gosh, this is the best freaking tomato I've ever tasted in my entire life. Uh, how do I break this to you? That's not a tomato, sweetie. Well, uh, tomatoes aren't in season right now, so I don't have a tomato to use as a prop. What else do you expect me to use? Is your goal to grow the most exotic fruits and vegetables you could get your dirty little paws on? It's Brad's Atomic Grape Tomato, only the most rare, coolest tomatoes on the planet. Look at them, they're psychedelic. They're just like so cool. I'm so cool. Oh, oh wow, thanks for the, what are these, tomatoes? Like, they're so weird looking. Are you growing your own food to preserve it and so that you have tons of food all year long? Yeah, yeah, you had a pretty good harvest this year, I mean, your tomatoes, like they weren't anything special per se, but I mean, they weren't bad. They certainly taste good. And you grew a lot of them. What are you talking about? Who cares what they taste like fresh? They were good and we got like 50 pints of tomato sauce to eat all year round. And from our green tomatoes, we got 70 pints of salsa verde. Who the heck cares what it tastes like fresh? Maybe your goal is to simply reduce your grocery budget. Dear sweet dearest, what'd you spend at the grocery store this month? How's our food budget looking? Well, lover buns, I can't tell you exactly, but I can tell you that I took extreme care to grow the most expensive things to buy. Maybe your goal is to stop going to the grocery store so much or at least limit your visits to like, you know, once a month. Honey, I don't, I don't understand. Why would you grow potatoes? They're so cheap at the grocery store, I don't get it. Well, lover buns, you have a point. But if I'm really honest with myself, my goal isn't to save money at the grocery store per se, it's to stop going to the grocery store altogether. We decided we have three main goals for our garden this year. 
The first is to grow what we actually eat. So it's not so much about saving money at the store on those more expensive items. It's that regardless what it costs at the grocery store, we wanna challenge ourselves to grow it on our own. We also like this idea of being self-sufficient, so we wanna challenge ourselves to grow our meat and potatoes, right? The second goal, rather than focusing on fresh eating, we wanna focus on preserving our harvest. It's gonna take years to figure this out, but we really wanna make sure that we have our staples not only during gardening season, but throughout the entire year. We nailed the salsa verde and the tomato sauce. But aside from that, I can't say we were able to preserve a ton of our harvest. That's not entirely true. We did put away a lot of kale and chard in the freezer, which we've been adding to soups and smoothies, and it's been incredible. And last but not least, we wanna have a little bit of fun. Not gonna lie, we really wanna impress friends, family, and neighbors when we give them Brad's Atomic Grape Tomato. I also can't resist the urge to attempt growing some sort of tiny little compact torpedo melon. You know, just for funsies. Once we established the goal of our garden, then I sat down and I wrote out a list of things we absolutely must grow, and then things we're sort of on the fence about, things we probably want to grow, but if we're really honest with ourselves, it's probably not that critical, so it's more gonna come down to whether or not we have the space. All right, my list isn't perfect, but I think you guys get the idea. So now that we know our goals of our garden and roughly what we want to plant, what I found to be really helpful is to lay out your entire garden on paper. A lot of people have asked me what I've been using to do this and I've been using Adobe Illustrator, which probably isn't a tool most people are gonna have access to. I know there are like garden planning softwares on the internet and in all honesty, there's nothing wrong with a pen and paper. This is where my OCD starts to kick in. Not everyone needs this level of planning. So this is what I've done. I, I've created a document of our raised beds. And for those of you that have been following us for a while, no, that we don't have any raised beds in the middle of the garden. All we got around to was the perimeter of the garden. And last year we put a bunch of giant round containers, about seven of them, in the middle of the garden for our potatoes. But our long-term plan is to put two raised beds in there with a space in between so we can, I guess, take a shortcut between that planting space. And that's something we're hoping to get started on as soon as the snow's gone. We've also gone ahead and drew out the containers that we're now gonna have available. And in my mind, we've positioned these around the garden where they're probably going to go. If you don't have a garden yet, if you have a completely blank slate, I'm not gonna talk about where to put your beds and stuff like that. I feel like there's probably a lot of great videos out there or articles on maybe how you can create a garden space and build your raised beds, I'm assuming that you already have maybe somewhat of an established garden or a couple of beds to work with, or at least a couple of containers. The next thing we did was try to decide what we want to plant where. And I'd say this was probably the most difficult phase of the garden plan this year, because to know what you want where, you also have to know how much of said vegetable you're gonna plant. So for us, we kinda went back and forth, and if you're a new gardener and you don't have a lot of experience under your belt, it can be really hard to know how much to plant of a certain vegetable. There's guides out there, various websites that can help you with that, but again, that really depends on your goals, whether you're trying to grow a bunch to preserve it or eat it fresh, right? Because we did have a garden last year, we had somewhat of a benchmark. From there, we were able to decide whether we want more or less of a certain plant or nix the plant altogether. There's a lot to take into consideration when it comes to deciding where to put what. I would say that we started with our most critical vegetables, which would be the tomatoes and the peppers. The first thing we took into account was crop rotation. When you rotate your crops, you're giving them access to different nutrients, and then it also helps prevent disease and fungus, stuff like that. If you wanna know technicalities, look it up. We had all of our tomatoes last year on the north side of our garden. So we thought, well, if we have a lot of tomatoes, let's move it onto the south side of the garden. But then I was a little bit worried. So the next thing you wanna think about is 
shade. If you don't think about where the sun is in the sky, you might find that you plant a tall plant in front of a shorter plant, so that shorter plant isn't allowed to thrive because the sun's casting a shadow on it. Because we wanna grow stuff next to our tomato plants, we decided not to put it on the south side after all, so I decided that we're gonna put all of our tomato plants in the raised beds that we're going to build. I'm pretty sure that by having the tomato plants in the middle there, the sun should be high enough in the sky that it's not gonna affect anything to the north of the plants. We had a lot of tomatoes last year, but we want more tomatoes this year because in addition to salsa and tomato sauce, we really want diced tomatoes too because those are really great in soups. I think we had like nine tomato plants last year and here I have 12 and what I decided is we're probably gonna nix the tomatillos because to me salsa verde, what we've been making out of green tomatoes that were unripe, made a really good salsa. I don't know that we need, I think genuine salsa verde, which I think, correct me if I'm wrong, is made from tomatillos. Point being, I'm pretty sure to us, tomatoes are more valuable to tomatillos, so end of story, the center of our garden is all tomato plants. Another thing you wanna think about is the spacing of your plants. A really great place to go is seed company websites. You might find that tomatoes can be grown, I think somewhere between 18 inches and three feet apart. I think a lot of people decide that two feet apart is pretty good and that's a vegetable that you might not want to uh, risk crowding. So we did these spacings on two feet apart and that should be just perfect in those center raised beds. But if we were to put them on the sides of the garden, we wouldn't be able to get two tomato plants next to each other. So to maximize that space, we'd have to grow another plant right next to it, which is what we did last year. And the tomatoes were so big and overpowering that we, whatever we planted right next to them, like basil and jalapenos and peppers, they didn't do very good. But I could also argue that we did a very poor job pruning. So again, these are just things to take into consideration. Next, we dropped in all the peppers we want to grow and we decided on four different varieties. And we did plant some of these there last year, but we're not we're gonna worry about it for now. I think we decided we're gonna put our potato plants here. We estimated, based on our calculations and internet research, that this is roughly the equivalent of a four by eight space for potatoes. And I think we assumed that might get us around 32 pounds ish. This kind of brings me to a point I'm going to make later of keeping track of this stuff because you're probably going to be wrong. We're just making a hypothesis and we're going from there. I think we decided to put our onions over here. Basil decided to put a bunch of lettuce down here. We're going to try the cut and come again method. We got our beets, carrots, nasturtiums. Another thing you wanna think about is the idea of companion planting. I know not everyone worries about this. The idea is that certain plants benefit one another. Maybe one plant attracts pests that you don't want on the other plant. There's all sorts of companion plant tables and information on the internet if you're interested in looking into that. For example, something we want to try is our kale last year completely got overrun with aphids. We were able to salvage it, but I literally took every single leaf and I blasted every single one off, every nook and cranny with the hose to save the kale. So I did a little bit of research and it seems that kale and calendula might do well together and that calendula has the ability to deter aphids. I'm willing to try it out. So I'm planning on planting calendula on both sides of the kale, making kind of like a kale sandwich. We also took into account kind of the visual appeal of the garden. What do we want where? And what I mean by that is we want to grow a lot of edible flowers like nasturtium and calendula. Marigolds are even edible. There's so many edible flowers out there if you're interested. Bachelor buttons, we grew those last year. I didn't want all the flowers in one spot, so I tried to kind of 
scatter them around the garden because flowers make me and most people very happy. Those could also be what attracts pollinators. So just one more thing to kind of think about when deciding where to place things. So we're gonna be growing these, what are called torpedo melons that we got off the Johnny's website. They grow to be about, I think like 1.2, one and a half pounds, somewhere in there. So we think it's gonna be manageable. And if for some reason it decides to like take over the garden, we have the ability to move the pots. Basically, it's not gonna take over a raised bed like our spaghetti squash did last year. So lesson learned. We also learned we're not gonna grow spaghetti squash again because we only ate a handful of them. And from one plant, we got 40 spaghetti squash. We ended up donating them. We decided we're gonna try our hands at strawberries. So we're gonna put those in probably four pots or so. If we have space, we thought we might try growing cucumber again. All right, so somewhere in there, you're gonna start asking your, yourself the question, what do I want to grow specifically? There's nothing wrong with running to Home Depot or anywhere, the grocery store where there's seeds and planting those seeds. There's a lot of great seeds, but if you're wanting to take your gardening to the next level, it kind of goes back to your goals. How can you best accomplish that through specific varieties? So something I learned last year, there's what they call slicer tomatoes, which are great for eating fresh. I imagine they just have like mind blowing flavor. And then there's what they call paste tomatoes, which are really great for canning because they're less juicy and they're more meaty. So if you're wanting to make something like a pasta sauce and you go with a meaty tomato, you're gonna have to cook it down less to evaporate all the moisture. And if you want something like diced tomatoes, good luck trying to can something and cut something with no meat and it's all juice. We decided we're going close to 100% paste tomatoes. And of those paste tomatoes, we wanted the best of the best. So a lot of people talk about the Amish paste tomato and people just rave about them. We didn't grow those last year, so we knew we wanted to try some Amish paste tomatoes. We also grew some Opulka tomatoes last year. Someone gave us the starts and said they were good, so we tried them out. So we knew we wanted Opalka tomatoes. We then started asking ourselves, uh, well, if there's different varieties for tomatoes for say fresh versus preserving, what else might we run into that with? And it turns out there's a lot of varieties that are better for fresh eating or preserving. So let's take carrots into example. There's a lot of carrots out there. We tried to grow some rainbow carrots last year, but there's carrots that are sweeter, carrots that have an earlier yield, carrots that have a later yield, baby carrots, ones that are long and slender, ones that are short and fat, and then there's carrots that store really, really well. And a lot of seed companies, they have this stuff listed on their website. So the Johnny's website, you can see if you go to their carrot section, they tell you what the carrot's known for. So we are really tempted to get these Bolero. Then we learned there's a lot of hybrid varieties out there or F1 varieties, and you can't really save the seed from these varieties because the following year, it's not gonna be true to type. So then we started researching more into these heirloom varieties, open pollinated varieties, and these varieties you can save the seed from year after year. We do wanna save seeds this year. We didn't do that last year. Originally, I had a lot of hybrid varieties because I didn't really understand what they were, but I slowly started replacing things on my list with things that we could save the seed from. I know there's a lot of seed companies out there. We've barely seen the tip of the icebergs, but someone told us to check out Baker Creek Heirloom Seeds, and that's what they focus on. With tomatoes, we knew that in addition to canning our little hearts out with paste tomatoes, we did want some stuff more in the fun category. We had a sun sugar tomato last year, and we love them so much, we thought what other smaller cherry-like tomato varieties are out there, so we started doing some research, and again, we were on the Baker Creek Heirloom Seeds website, and we decided on those Brad's Atomic Grape Tomato because they look really cool. And then we decided on a couple other varieties that are just known for being really good. 
I will say if you plan on buying your seeds online and from websites, you are gonna spend a little bit more than if you're buying them locally. But if you can get these heirloom or open pollinated varieties that you could save seed from, you can argue that it's kind of a one-time cost. But we're, we're so excited to have our best garden ever and we want the best yield possible that we are willing to spend the money this year for those seeds and get exactly what we want. So I created a master spreadsheet of our garden plan for the year to keep my sanity. What I included in this spreadsheet was a list of what we're gonna plant in the far left column. I then listed the quantity we want of each plant. How many seeds are in every packet to make sure that we only needed one packet. I then got even more OCD and I listed out the total starts we're gonna have after thinning. And because we have a space to start a lot of seeds indoors, I listed the leftover starts we're gonna have for friends and neighbors because I'm hoping that we can help some people out. And I don't know how much of the seed I wanna save for next year. There are some things I'd really like to plant them all. And it helps me understand what I can offer to people that are wanting starts. And then I went ahead and I added a row for when to start these seeds indoors, and that's relative to the last frost date, and we're gonna talk about that in a minute here. I then added a row, and I have these on a corresponding calendar, when to start these indoors. I put spacing notes in here. I put note notes in here. Anything I found that I thought maybe I'm gonna forget or would be helpful to see at a glance, I wanted one place to access my ginormous master plan. And lastly, I included where to buy the seeds. But I guess what I'm trying to get at with this spreadsheet is for me personally, I need that master plan because life's about to get hecka busy and I don't want to be mulling over these details. I want to do all my research now during winter when I have the time. That way I can just look at my calendar and I don't have to think anymore. All I have to do is follow my plan. So originally when I did this, I separated it out by veggies, herbs, fruit, and flowers. But then I reorganized everything by the date to start the seeds indoors or direct sow the seeds, whichever way we plan on going. And this to me is gold and I feel it might be most valuable next season because there will be things about this that worked and probably things that didn't, but it helps us understand what our strategy was for the year and probably especially when we got things in the ground, what the quantity was, so super valuable tool. Whew, that's a lot of information. You people that are still watching, you guys are my people. We're gonna take a quick recess and we're gonna go outside and we're gonna talk about frost dates. And I have something really special to share with you guys. It's cooled off quite a bit. We have some deer visitors on our hillside up there. It's pretty awesome. So when it comes to planning your garden, knowing the date of your last frost will become your best friend. You can discover the, the average date of your last frost by knowing which gardening zone you're in. If you don't know, a really great place to start would be to Google it. Just type in your zip code and a rough idea of what zone you're in should come up. Now, I would say that's not black or white because in our area, we have a bajillion microclimates. So we're technically probably in a different zone than even some of our neighbors because we have a property that faces the south and we get loads of daylight. So in general, our property is warmer and we get more sun. All that said, our average date of last frost, I think is somewhere between May 15th and May 20th. Yes, that probably sounds pretty late to some of you, but I can also tell you that last year we had a good frost in the beginning to middle of June. So it worked out really well that we didn't start our garden for a while because a lot of people had a lot of damage to their garden and lost some crops, right? So I would say after knowing 
what we're gonna plant, where we're gonna plant, what varieties we're gonna plant. That was kind of the last key to the puzzle is when do we start this shindig? But I think what I'm wanting to do this year is play it safe because I know with all this planning that we've done, there's no way, there's no way we won't have our best garden ever. And if it turns out we could have maximized it two more weeks, that's great. Okay, I told you I have something special. Are you guys ready? No way, right? Aren't those ridiculously cool? So a kind subscriber that's been following us for a while, he makes these things and he offered to send us some for the garden. His name is Kevin and he's based out of California. But to me, in addition to our garden being something highly practical and functional, it's also a place of inspiration to Jesse and I. Whether or not the garden needs tending to, we enjoy coming out here a minimum of once per day. More often than not, we are coming out here twice a day just because it filled our hearts with so much joy to see stuff growing in the ground. And every time we came out to the garden, we saw something different. A new flower had bloomed, there was a new critter crawling around, there was a pepper that we didn't see before. So to me, stuff like this it makes me really happy when you look at it, if that makes sense. So Kevin, thank you from both Jesse and I. This means a lot to us. We really love things that are handmade and made with love. My theory is that if we act like it's spring, well maybe spring will come, right? So what better time to stick these in the garden? If you guys are wondering what's with all the food scraps in our beds, we're kind of directly composting in our beds. I'm hoping it breaks down by the time it's time to plant, otherwise it might find its way uh, scraped off the top and into the compost pile, but our compost pile wasn't really accessible, so we decided to try something new. As much time as I've spent staring at that dang spreadsheet and illustrator file, I don't know that I got these exactly in the right position. Okay, a couple last things to share. Something we're gonna challenge ourselves to do this year is keep some sort of garden journal. To be honest, because we spend so much time on our computers, it'll probably be digital for the most part, but that doesn't mean there isn't place for a physical gardening journal. Something we might challenge ourselves to do is kind of scrapbook our year and show some of the successes and failures and maybe we'll end up just like designing it on the computer and printing it out and sticking it in a physical folder like this. But I also feel that this is something we could take out with us to the garden and write down our observations. A few things we haven't touched on. Watering, fertilizing, mulching, and there's probably a lot more. And I don't know that we need to for the sake of this video. But with those things, we've really taken the same methodology. We kind of thought about what we did last year, what worked well, what didn't work so well, where we can improve, did some research, came up with a plan, and now we're gonna work the plan. So I think in summing this up, what I wanna reinforce our goals are is that we're trying to create a no-brainer garden this year. And that does mean a lot of thought is put in up front so that during the season, we can just focus on implementing our plan and working the garden. But above everything else, I also want to reinforce that I think gardening is supposed to be fun. There's so many rabbit trails you can go down and there's so many ideas you can get hung up on that I think the biggest problem we have in our society is analysis paralysis. We want to be so right and we want to be so good and we're so afraid of failure that we end up doing nothing. So at the very end of the day, get out there, be awesome, and own it.
own your garden. For anyone that cares, our germination test went so well that we decided to test a few more seeds and maybe that's mold, but I can tell you after only a few days, a lot of these are germinating and we're so excited. We can't even share what it's gonna mean to us to get stuff in the ground this year. Got a few more days to cook, then we check. 